Hey guys, I'm Mike Roy, and due to the fact that all the fishing shows have been canceled uh, due to the coronavirus, I'm here today doing my seminar that I was supposed to do at the Rhode Island Saltwater Fishing Show and the Hartford uh, Hunting and Fishing Expo. So we're gonna carry on, fishing will carry on, and I'm gonna do my seminar from my living room, same seminar I would have done at the show. So I hope you check this out, hope you enjoy it. If you do, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm gonna be putting out a lot more YouTube videos trying to make the best of this situation. So my seminar is about, uh, so uh, not just striped bass fishing, all fishing. It's called The Truth. Um, but, big fish, not just big bass, all, all kinds of fish. Um, I don't just fish for striped bass. The reason why I'm calling it the truth is because I want to speak from my experience, my perspective. I think I have a unique experience because I am a full-time guide. I have been a full-time guide for five years and I do a tremendous amount of trips. I have a tremendous amount of time that I spend on the water. Um, for the most part, uh, during our season, I'm running 10 to 14 trips a week. Okay, so that means I'm fishing oftentimes twice a day, doing two five-hour trips a day. Um, and that has given me a unique experience um, that I'm gonna talk about in this seminar. Um, so let's move on. So, First thing you're probably wondering is why is there a bell curve and what is a bell curve? Why am I talking about this in a fishing seminar? So the reason why I'm talking about a bell curve is this is, so what a bell curve is, it is basically the midsection. This is what works two thirds of the time. Okay. The majority falls in the middle. Okay. So the way I fish is very similar to a bell curve. Because I'm guiding and I'm on the water so frequently, um, I don't use niche tactics as much. I really, because I need to maximize my time on the water. Most of my trips are five hours long, okay? Dock to dock, you know, we leave the dock and we do back in five hours and I have to catch fish. So in, in that against the clock, that's what makes guiding so difficult is that you're fishing against the clock. So I need to maximize my time and be as efficient as possible when I'm on the water. Therefore, my techniques, the way I fish, fall within this bell curve of what works two thirds of the time. Okay, so while you're watching this, I may say some things that you don't agree with or you may say, you know, you may have had an experience where, you know, you had to use a light leader or you used a particular color and maybe that worked in a niche situation but I speak of the majority of the time, and you know, I'll say something like, I almost always use white for a lure silk color. I don't mess around with different colors because I think there's other things that are more important. I'm gonna talk about this in the seminar. Again, I'm talking about what works the majority of the time. For me, it is a percentage game when I fish. Um, the other thing that's unique too is from my guiding experience, I fish up to three anglers at a time. It's myself plus you know either one, two, or three guys. So what's different about my experience than the majority of the anglers' experience is that when you're fishing, you're just worried about your rod. You're just thinking about your rod, you you know, your line, your lure, your bait. I'm looking at all three. When I have three guys fishing, I get a chance to step back and watch what all three people are doing. And sometimes I'll fish as well. So that gives me a little bit of a different experience because you may be using a technique or you may be using lure, it doesn't work, okay? I have the experience of, and this is why I'm so keen on presentation is so much more important than the type of, of lure you're using or why I'm not a big color fanatic with lures is because I do this day in and day out where I watch one guy on the boat or, or sometimes it's three guys on the boat and I know there's fish there and they can't get a bite and I'll take a rod or I'll have another person on the boat that will be using the same lure, same leader, this and that, 
and they will hook fish one after another. So I see these dramatic experiences where if you're fishing by yourself, you, you don't get, you probably don't see this, okay? You assume if you didn't get a bite that there was probably no fish there. And oftentimes there's a whole bunch of um, other factors that come into play. And I think that's what makes that the, uh, my experience as a guy a bit you, uh, unique compared to somebody that's just fishing, just worried about their rod. So, um, so we'll talk about the methods, how I fish, the most common methods. Um, now I do call myself and my charters a light tackle, or big fish and light tackle, okay? But don't be mistaken, um, I'm not just a light tackle guy that goes out and chases birds around, okay? That's, that's, I do a little bit of that, but the majority of what I do is actually not that. Um, so I'm talking about what are the most effective techniques and what puts fish in the boat day in and day out in the most variety of conditions, okay? So first thing is live bait fishing. I love live bait fishing, especially when I'm trying to target big fish. Um, and the two most common methods that I use, I guide in Connecticut uh, waters. So the two most effective live baits up here is going to be Live bunker, depending on where you're watching this, uh, Menhaden, Pogies, um, but we call them bunker here in Connecticut. So live bunker in the daytime is the most effective, and at night it is the live eel. Now, there are examples where you're going to say, oh, I use live eels. For example, if you fish Block Island, you're going to say live eels work great in the daytime. Okay, And that may be true in that situation where you have highly aggressive fish, um, and you don't get those big bunker over there. But again, I'm talking about the bell curve. I'm talking about what works the majority of the time. Live eels usually work best at night, not as good in the daytime. Live bunker is gonna be your best daytime bait and it's not gonna work as well as night. Um, those are the two live baits that I fish the most, but there's obviously a whole different um, uh, live bait options. Um, Cut bait, cut bait uh, or chunked bait is extremely effective. Um, cut bunker, very effective when striped bass are not feeding aggressively. Um, I've used it in Florida for tarpon with uh, cut ladyfish. Um, cut bait works everywhere in the country or the world. It's very effective because when you have lazy fish that don't want to come up and chase the bait around, oftentimes the cut bait is gonna get hit. Now, you might be asking, when do I know, or how do I know when to use a cut bait or a live bait or a lure, you know, um, you know in changing these techniques? Now that's something that's gonna come with time and experience. Um, so one thing that I'm very uh, big on is letting the fish tell me what they want. So for example, if I'm fishing with live bait and we're getting some hit, our bunkers are getting hit on the surface, and let's say the tide starts to slow down, and as that tide slows down, we're not getting hit, or the fish are just coming up and kind of playing with the bait, but they're not taking it aggressively. At that point, I'm gonna switch techniques. I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna fish cut bait, and oftentimes I'll switch to the cut bait, and that's gonna start working. So I'm letting those fish tell me what they want, and then, for example, you know, that may work for a little while. The tide may start to turn. They stop hitting the cut bait. Now I'm gonna go back to the live bait and see if that's gonna work. Um, so I'm always changing my tactic based on what the fish, how the fish are reacting. Um, three weighing, now different parts of the country, you know, this could be called drop shotting or just fishing uh, with a, 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 a weight. Um, but basically what I'm referring to when I say three weighing is a three way swivel with a sinker on one end and a leader to your live bait on the other end. Um, and what this does uh, is vertical fishing and it allows for depth control. So the reason why we use the three way swivel or just use our fishing our live bait with a sinker is that let's say when we get to 20 feet or more, if I'm in, for example, 40 feet of water, a live bait on the surface is not going to be very effective, um, particularly for striped bass, because they're going to be within a few feet of the bottom. So what I want to do is I'm going to fish my bait on, um, on a weighted rig, vertical, straight up and down, 
weight hits the bottom, I'm gonna come about two cranks off the bottom. That'll give me about five feet or so off the bottom and the strep bass are gonna be very close to the bottom. They're gonna be looking up, feeding up. So if my bait is too far in the water column, they're not gonna uh, swim up to grab it. And then obviously, I don't, don't want my sinker dragging the bottom because I'm gonna get snagged up. So three weighing is very effective because it allows an accurate um, presentation you know, in, in the water depth so I can have my bait right in the strike zone within a few feet of the bottom. Um, next method is, uh, so artificials, fishing with lures. Um, I do fish a lot of different lures, top water lures, um, it, it, you know, we fish um, uh, weighted lures, which I'm going to talk about that more in a few minutes. Um, but there are times when artificials, particularly when fish are aggressive, um, artificials can work very well. And the last method is vertical jigging. Um, vertical jigging, like with a diamond jig or a metal lure, um, extremely effective, especially when you're using your sonar and you're marking big, thick schools of fish under your boat. Um, it works great in, in deep areas where you have fast moving current, uh, highly effective. I, do, I use this method, I do a lot of vertical jigging, especially in the fall, works very, very well. Presentation is God. So your presentation, how you're fishing the lure, how you present your lure bait in the water is the most important aspect. I think it is far more important than the color, the brand of lure, whether your lure has glitter on it, whatever, the way you present it is the most important thing. So, um, starting, for example, with the water column. If fish are down deep and I'm fishing a surface lure, probably not gonna be very effective. So, and also, if I'm using a lure that's too heavy, too heavy of a jig, and it's dragging bottom, doesn't look natural, it's not gonna be effective. Oftentimes, um, fish want to um, have a nat natural presentation. So a good example of this would be, let's say I'm fishing f uh, in the spring in the estuaries for striped bass. Um, the water's still cold, they're pretty lethargic, okay? If, so there's a, a few things that are coming, a uh, few factors that are, are, are gonna matter here. So casting angle for one. Um, I may need to be casting my lure up current at a particular angle. So that's something I'm gonna play with, you know, casting at a 45 degree angle, or, you know, different angles. So the current is gonna allow the lure to penetrate the water differently. Uh, next thing is, uh, with those fish being lethargic, if you're reeling faster than the current speed, if I'm reeling my lure too fast and it's moving faster than the current, it's not gonna look natural. Those fish are very finicky at that time of year they're not gonna react and they're not gonna bite that, that lure. Um, so oftentimes you have to cast at a particular angle and your retrieve speed has to be just fast enough so that lure, or I should say slow enough, so the lure is swinging naturally in the water column and it's not getting dragged up with the current, it's not, it's not moving faster than the current. My point of this is that presentation is the most important thing. So. Oftentimes, as fishermen, maybe just as, as human beings, we tend to want to put the blame on something else. So it's gonna, we're gonna say, oh, I had to go down to a lighter leader, or oh, it was the color, or oh, it was this. Oftentimes, I think what happens is when you start um, going through different lures, and I think a lot of anglers, when they first start fishing or just less experienced, tend to change lures very quickly. Um, and I think this, this is a mistake because Oftentimes, it's not the actual lure that you're using. It is the presentation, your retrieve speed, where you're casting it, um, that's gonna really draw the strike. And what happens is, you know, you'll, you'll hear something like, oh, the only thing they would touch is chartreuse or green, right? It's the only thing they would touch. I think a lot of times when you hear that, what happens is that, you know, you've been cycling through lures, you haven't been uh, catch anything and then you happen to have that particular color say it's chartreuse and now that either the fish have turned on due to a change in the environment like a change in tide or you've just slowed your retrieve down or sped it up or you know you've kind of cracked the code and you're retrieving the lure at with the right technique 
and coincidentally, you happen to have a, char a chartreuse lure on, now you're going to go around and you're going to be convinced that the only thing they would touch in char was chartreuse. In reality, it had more to do with the change in environment and the change of your technique. That's why the fish turned on. Again, I'm talking about the bell curve, what works the majority of the time. Um, and I think presentation is the most important. Um, boat drift, you know, um, I did a seminar a couple months ago uh, to uh, surf casting club. And you know, one of the things that we talked about is when you're surf casting, you're stationary. You're fishing from, you're not moving, okay? When you're fishing from a boat, one of the things that makes boat fishing so complex is that um, you have, you, you know, you're, as you're fishing, you're moving. You, you, so your lure's moving with the current, the boat's moving with the current, and you also have wind factor. So the boat is moving with the wind and the current. So you have, two to, you have several things going on here. So you have to account for those things. So what I mean by this is, let's say you're, the wind is, is uh, blowing your boat or uh, making your boat drift faster than the current, you're gonna need to retreat to slow your retrieve speed down. Um, because your lure is gonna be moving that much faster through the water because your boat is moving. Um, so you have to think about these, these different variables and how they impact your presentation. Um, another thing that and I can talk a lot about this is boat control. Being able to control your boat. I personally use a Minn Kota trolling motor. That allows for maximum boat control. Whether I have the boat on spot lock or I'm using the autopilot to offset the wind. And that's going to impact my presentation as well. So, whether you're fishing from a boat, from shore, from a kayak, with a troll motor, without one, um, you have to be aware of how these different, you know, the movement of the boat and the current uh, and the wind is going to impact your retrieve and your presentation. Um, one big thing for me, with, and I fish with, I have clients of all different levels, from the first time fishing, not even being able to cast the rod, to very, very experienced anglers that have fished all over the world. And the, one of the most common mistakes is not staying in contact with your bait or lure. You have to always be in contact, always feeling that. And also I see a lot of people, you know, I'm watching them fish and I could see them get a strike. Oftentimes strikes can be light and, and a soft tap and they're just not feeling that hit and not setting the hook appropriately. Um, you know, another thing too, I think that's biggest confidence. So if you fish, if every time you cast you, and you're retrieving your lure, if you imagine a fish behind your lure, you would, you would catch more fish, all right? Because oftentimes what happens is, you know, if we see a fish follow the lure, we start to, to think and we start to, you know, we, we start to really focus. And other times just casting aimlessly, okay? So the more confident you are and the more you can imagine that you're going to get a strike on that cast, the more successful you're going to be, you're going to be working, your, your lure, your technique is going to be better. Um, Non-linear motion, okay, and reaction strikes. I'm a big believer, particularly with striped bass fishing, that fish like uh, baits that move erratically. So rather than have a lure that's going to work in a straight line, for example, I think striped bass react much better to a lure that can dart side to side, break that one plane of movement, uh, whether it's, it's down, up, side to side, uh, pause it, speed it up. They react to a change of speed and direction, uh, speed and, direction and that causes a reaction strike. Aggression level. It's one of the most important aspects of fishing that, that is often not talked about. Um, so when fish are aggressive, um, you know, I may be getting to a spot and we throw baits, you know, maybe two or three people are fishing and the second the bait hits the water, they're getting smashed out of the water. There may be two, three, four, five fish fighting over a bait. That's when fish are being extremely aggressive, okay? And then the opposite, and this happens a lot too, where we, we go to a spot and we're marking a lot of fish, and I know fish are there, and we put baits in the water, and they're not, the fish aren't hitting it, or they're coming up, and maybe they just boil out, they play around with it, okay? And they just don't have that aggression level. Um, 
that's when, you know, when this, when I see this happening, I know it's going to be a, a difficult time uh, to, to hook fish. Um, <clears throat> more often than not, there are fish in, in areas that you're fishing that are not biting. And this happens a lot. And, and you really see this when you, when you have good electronics, you'll, you'll experience this more and more. Um, you know, and this is something that I think gets a little bit blown out of proportion is leader size. Now, I know light leaders and changing leader size can be very important. You know, if you're sail fishing in Florida with pelagic fish or fish that are, you know, very clear water conditions, leader material, leader size can be important. But again, I'm talking the bell curve, day in and day out in the Northeast where we don't have very clear water. Um, if I'm fishing for big fish, big striped bass, for example, I'm usually using a 60 pound leader. Um, I have found very little um, difference when I go down to say 50 or 40, even 30 pound leader. When those fish, and, and this is my point, okay? Before you get an opinion, just hear me out here. What happens is, <clears throat> and I've done this when we have, we're live bunker fishing and striped bass are just coming up and they're just kind of splashing at the bait. They're not taking the bait. Okay, those times I've gone down to 20 pound fluorocarbon with a live bunker, okay? Does not make any difference because those fish, and you may occasionally hook the village idiot, but the fish are not in a high aggression feed, um, and it could be due to boat pressure, it could be because the sun's too high, and in those situations, oftentimes, you know, there's two schools of thought, you could pound your head against the gunnel, and you'll eventually hook a fish, um, or you need to go deep, and find fish that are deeper or in a different location where there's no boat pressure and find fish that are going to be more reactive. So my point being, it has a lot more to do in a lot of situations with the aggression level than, um, you know, than the lure or then going down to a light leader. My, and I'm not saying going down to a light leader never helps, but what I'm saying is um, oftentimes it's, it's the behavior of the fish. One more quick example of this is when we're fishing for Benin and false albacore, false albacore or albies particularly in the fall. There are times when those fish are very, very easy to catch. There's other days when they're blowing uh, anchovies out of the water and you see them and they're there and we're getting great casts and this and that and guys get very, I think one of the things that makes those difficult is it's the angler getting too excited and, and making mistakes. Um, but those days when those fish are blowing out of the water, this and that, and you're casting into them and, and everything's perfect, and, they, and you know, you're getting shots at them and they're not biting, it's just because they have, they're just not feeding. Okay, in those situations, a lot of times you need to go somewhere else, you need to get away from the boats, or you need to just fish for something else. For whatever reason, they're not gonna hit a lure. It has nothing to do with, and you could try the lightest line and different lures and this and that. It has more to do with their aggression level. They're not going to react. They're not going to hit a piece of plastic or a piece of metal that that particular tide for who knows why. There's there's a you know all different theories, all different reasons. Um, but I know that they they're not aggressive. They're not going to hit a lure, um, and it has more to do with the behavior of the fish than the actual lure or or line that you, you're uh, using. Um, my top artificials, again, this is what I fish majority of the time. Uh, if, if I could just fish these lures and I know I'll be successful with these, this is what works the majority. Um, so soft plastics, probably the most versatile lure in the world um, because there's so many different ways you could fish them. Um, this is a nine inch soft plastic. This is a five inch soft plastic. Um, so. Unweighted soft plastics, you get a lot of that side-to-side uh, -side action, up and down action. You can pause it, they have a neutral buoyancy. Again, it's about getting a reaction strike. Breaking that linear motion is what makes soft plastics so uh, effective. Being able to work that bait erratically, let it sink. You can fish these with, um, with these owner beast hooks with uh, keel weights on them to get them deeper or they could be rigged on a jig head, which I'm going to talk about in a second, to get down deeper. Um, the versatility is what makes them so effective. Uh, a bucktail jig head that I'm talking about. Um, 
So this is an example of a soft plastic on a jig head. This is probably the go-to estuary, springtime estuary striped bass lure. Um, and uh, just a uh, small soft plastic on a half ounce jig head. Um, bucktail jig is a lure that looks like nothing but catches everything. And these are often tipped with a piece of pork rind. Um, but why are they effective? Because I could penetrate the water column, I could use different, you know, a half ounce, a one ounce, a three ounce to get down to where the fish are and put it in the strike zone and they'll swing with the current. I could get a natural presentation working them with the current. That's what makes uh, jig heads so effective. Um, next is top water. I, I fish a lot of top water, uh, particularly first light and last light when fish are going to come up to the surface. They do react very well to poppers and spook style lures. Um, and I, I do use different, I think size matters, profile matters. So when fish are keyed on small bait, you know, a small lure, bigger bait, you use a, a larger lure, obviously. Um, and, uh, but with the spooks, it's about breaking that straight retrieve and getting an erratic action that gets fish to react so well to them. Um, last thing is metal. Um, metal works great, particularly in the northeast in the fall when fish are highly aggressive and uh, on windy days you could cast them really well. You could also fish them vertically, but this is a little um, Shimano Cult Sniper. They make these in different sizes, so depending on water depth current, um, these are work very well when fish are feeding aggressively. Finesse fishing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot of finesse fishing. Now, finesse fishing can mean uh, a variety of uh, different things. So if you're a largemouth bass fisherman, when you talk of finesse fishing, you're talking about six pound line, okay? In salt water where I fish, when I talk about finesse fishing, I'm talking about using 15, 20 pound braided line with a you know, 20, 30 pound leader um, and being able to cast small lures, okay? Um, oftentimes, if you're using big heavy gear, you're not going to get action out of a small lure, okay? So you got to scale down your tackle to fish the, the you know, um, the appropriate lure. Um, oftentimes with, you know, we have a lot of smaller fish, a lot of small bait around, finesse tactics are going to outfish your conventional methods. Uh, you know, one example would be um, also when we're vertical jigging in an area like the race or a deep area, we have a lot of current flow, a lot of times we're going to use that lighter line with maybe a hundred gram jig, you know, that's about three and a half, four ounce jig, and that will outfish and outcatch guys with big heavy conventional using 12 ounce jigs just because uh, lighter, the, always the lightest you can go, the more strikes you're going to get. If they're smaller fish, you're obviously going to hit a smaller lure. If they're feeding on a small bait like sand eels, that's where using small lures and scaling down your tackle um, can result in a lot more action. Um, <clears throat> electronics. Now, having good electronics on your boat is, is, is critical. Um, I would take a cheaper boat with good electronics over a very expensive boat with poor electronics. You know, it's, it's funny, the joke is, you know, the guy that goes out and buys a $150,000 center console and then sticks a $500 GPS in there and fish finder, you know. You want to have good electronics, it's really going to make the biggest difference in your, your fishing. Um, you know, this is an example of my Humminbird Solix. Uh, this is a screenshot of the side imaging. Now we're only looking out 100 feet to each side, but we're, or 50 feet to each side, 100 feet total. But here we are, we're only in eight feet of water and we're marking fish on both sides of the boat that with traditional sonar, we would never know we're there. And you know, I have a question for you guys. If you knew there was fish, if you go fishing, you don't catch anything. Okay, you assume there's no fish there. Particularly if you're a surf caster, or maybe you don't, you know, you're a kayak or a boat fisherman, but you don't really know your, electronic, your electronics that well. Okay, <clears throat> now you, you go, you assume there's no fish there. Now, how would this impact you or change the way you're fishing if you were fishing 
and you knew there was hundreds of fish around you, but you weren't catching anything. And I gotta be honest with you, this happens a lot. Happens way more than people realize. You'll realize it more when you have good electronics and you, you know how to use them, but there are fish do not feed 24 seven. So there's many times where we're fishing and there's boats go right past us. They don't even know the fish are there. And there's hundreds of fish around us that may not be aggressive, but knowing they're there, I'd rather know they're there than, you know, not. But uh, it's something to think about, especially if you're a surf caster. Uh, you know, you, there are times when you could be fishing, fish may be there and they're simply not biting. <clears throat> so again, I was just talking about change of direction and speed. I normally play a, a small video here, but I'm just going to show you what I mean. I think I've talked about this enough, but um, any time that we can change the direction or speed, that's going to cause a reaction strike. So oftentimes, let's say you see a fish following your lure, um, try pausing the lure. Try speeding it up. Try doing a couple twitches, then stopping it. Then doing three twitches and stopping it. Then one. My point being, you don't want to have a mechanical retrieve. Okay, you, if, if it looks mechanical, fish are just going to look at it and turn away. You have to do something to entice them to bite. Okay, and that's going to be working with a particular action, changing the speed, changing the direction. That's what gets get fish to react and hit a piece of plastic or a piece of rubber. Um, intuition, okay. I'm a big believer in when you fish, you have to really imply some intuition. You have to analyze what's happening and change with that, react to the environment, okay. So a real famous quote that I like is called fish the moment, okay. You have to fish what's happening right then and there. Okay, as a guide, this is really important for me because there's many times where I'll do, I'll be on the water for five hours and then my trip ends, go back to the dock, drop my clients off, pick my new group up, and an hour later, right back in the same spot. And there's many times where we left fish that were biting, we get back there, those fish won't bite or they've moved. So I gotta forget about what happened this morning. I gotta forget about what happened an hour ago and come up with a new game plan. So this is intuition. Um, there could be a change in, in the tide can change, the wind can change, um, you know, and as that happens, as the environment's changing, and again, um, letting the fish tell me what they want. If the fish aren't biting, I'm gonna keep changing my tactics or my location until I can get a bite. Um, and that's just implying my own intuition from, from what I see being on the water every day. Um, you know, water temperature um, and so and tide and and how this changes. Um, oftentimes, um, an area in the springtime. So as the season changes, for example, the springtime, a certain area may fish well on the outgoing tide because that shallow water coming out of the estuary is warmer. Okay, and those fish want to be in warmer water. In the summer, that same spot may fish best on the incoming tide because that river water is too warm now and they want cooler water coming in. My point being, oftentimes with many spots, it's not just good on one, most spots fish well on more than one tide. And this may change throughout the year due to different factors, okay? So keeping a detailed log book is, is a good thing to do and I've always had a log book just taking notes down when I fish, what tide it was, you know, when the fish bit, when they didn't bite. But also, you don't want to use that to become closed-minded. Because what I see, and I know a lot of people, that they'll only fish a spot, or they'll only do things that they've had previous success doing, okay? The problem with that is you'll close yourself off to learning new spots, new techniques. Um, like I said, oftentimes, a lot of spots fish well on more than one tide and that can change throughout the, uh, the course of the season. <clears throat> um, so in the fall, I had the chance to fish with uh, Mike I. Canelli, very famous professional freshwater bass tournament fisherman. And 
I said to Mike, um, or Ike, I said, um, you know, Ike, what, do you ever go to a lake and fish a tournament on a lake that you've never fished before? And you're fishing against a guy that that's his home lake. And he said, yeah, it happens. It happens a lot. I said, really? I said, I would think that the home, that the guy that, you know, that's his home lake would, would just blow everybody away. He said, actually, oftentimes it's the opposite. Because what happens is that guy that is, he's on his home lake, he's fishing his history. He's thinking about what happened and he's going and fishing that. So that's why fish the moment, okay? Fishing reports, I think following fishing reports is a mistake. Don't worry about what happened yesterday. Don't worry about what happened, um, you know, this morning. You have to really fish the moment and forget about the history. Um, I think one of the top mistakes is that we get too caught up in following a fishing report. Um, and you also gotta keep in mind, most fishermen lie for different reasons, or a lot of them lie, maybe it's ego, maybe it's because they wanna promote their brand or their business, whatever. So most fishermen over-exaggerate what they catch and not under-exaggerate. Um, and I think that you always gotta keep that in mind and worry about what's happening in your boat, not what's happening in other people's boats. I think getting away from the fleet mentality um, and not just following around looking what other boats are doing. Because a lot of other boats are looking at you, you know, wondering what you're doing and you could, you're doing the same thing to them. So it really doesn't make that much sense. Focus on the fish, focus on the environment and you'll have a lot more success. Um, I think driving over fish is, is a problem. I do see a lot of people, they come in hot to a spot, you know, they come in, they just slip, come off the throttle at 30 miles an hour or whatever, and then start casting. I think you want to ease into your spot, set your drift up. Um, you know, there's times, depending on the aggression level, I've seen it where a 40 foot Hatteras with twin diesels is trolling in 10 feet of water, and those fish keep on biting. They're not phased by it. But there's other days where I've been fishing and we just step and that noise from your, your footstep scares and all these fish scatter. So I think it's better to be, you know, when fish are finicky, you want to ease into them, try not to spook them. And there's some days where it doesn't matter. Um, where's the best spot? Now there is no utopia spot. There's no fish that always, hold, there's no spot that always holds fish. So. I think you want to um, focus on learning spots within the spots and being able to adapt and adjust when there's no fish there because there's, there's no spot that always has fish. So every spot is good when it's good and even the best spots when there's no fish there, they're not good. So fish move, they move throughout the tide cycle, so really being able to understand, read the water, read your electronics, use your sonar, use your chart. The chartography nowadays is so good. I run a Navionics ship in my, my Humminbird and the detail that I could see, I could look at that chart and find my own spots and, and you know start to really eliminate water and find the most uh, likely spots where fish are gonna hold. How's the internet ruined fishing? Now I went into a tackle shop a couple years ago and that's what somebody told me, the internet's ruined fishing, okay? The internet's been around for 20 years. Uh, social media's been around since the early 2000s, okay? I remember when Facebook was just starting, I was in college in 2003, 2002, and it was just getting started, okay? It's nothing new, it's been around for a long time. Information does travel, there's pros and cons, I mean, the benefit is you can get a lot of information from your home. You're watching me right now, this is great during a, um, you know, a crisis, we're still able to communicate with each other. So there's a lot of, I think the pros outweigh the cons, but you do have to be careful and use common sense, okay? Now, if I'm out fishing, um, naturally people wanna post fishing pictures and, and, and that's fine, but if I'm out fishing and there is a, a hot bite and there's fish all over the place on a particular spot, especially if it's a spot that maybe people don't know about, or maybe it is a spot that's well known, but nobody's fishing it, I'm not going to go on Facebook Live and do a live broadcast. Um, that's obviously going to be a problem because the next day, if I just told you know 10,000 people that I'm on this great bite, there's going to be a lot of boats there tomorrow. 
So it's common sense stuff. Now, right now, um, in, uh, in March, or, you know, we're not fishing right now. So if I was to tell you the best reefs in Long Island Sound, okay, that's not, that's not a problem. We, you, that's common knowledge. You could go on any, you could find any book, any, any website, any tap shop, and they'll tell you, you know, Bertlitz Reef and the Reefs and Plum Gun and all, all these different reefs that are good spots. It's knowing when the fish are there, how, um, how to fish it, um, and there's obviously certain spots that maybe you find on your own that you want to be more quiet about, okay? So I think this, what's called spot burning, gets blown out of proportion sometimes. I mean, you know, there's people that um, go too extreme with it and they think talking about fishing is spot burning. Um, and uh, oftentimes there's things that are common knowledge and to me the real issue is, you know, real time, um, I'm not gonna go and do a lot, I don't think it's smart to do a live video and say, oh my God, all these fish are right here, right now, you gotta be here, you know, get down here as soon as you can, that's a problem. But educating people on fishing, um, talking about, you know, certain reefs and this and that, that's okay. And that's always been something, uh, you know, that's been done well before the internet. Um, catch and release, now I am a big catch and release um, fishermen, I've been doing it long before it was trendy. It is great to see more and more people doing catch and release, practicing good fish handling, okay, minimizing the time that the fish is out of the water. Um, you know, if you're gut hooking fish, trying to either modify the way that, that you're setting the hook, or uh, you know, if you're using a J hook, don't let the fish run with it and swallow it. Use circle hooks if you're doing that. Um, you know, uh, handling the fish properly is important. Reviving the fish. You don't just talk, especially a bigger fish when the water's warm. You don't just throw the fish back in the water. You have to sit there, you have to revive it. I think it is important for the future and sustainability of sport fishing that people are practicing good catch and release. I also don't like to see people criticizing. I think it's ridiculous when uh, these people on the internet and stuff that criticize people for keeping a fish. If you're legally allowed to do so, and you know there is management and, and reasons why we are allowed to keep a certain amount of fish, and there's different size and creel limits, um, but if somebody legally wants to take a fish and they want to eat a fish, that's okay too. Um, but not keeping what you're not going to eat, not wasting fish, is obviously critical. <clears throat> Thank you, we're gonna wrap this up right now. If you like this, um, I hope that if you're self-quarantining right now, um, or maybe you're watching this in the future, uh, but please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm gonna to try to put up more content. Instagram, Real Cash Charters. My name is Mike Roy. Um, my information, realcashcharters.com. If you're looking to do a fishing charter with me, Jump on the website, get in touch with me, and good luck, be safe.